God. And before we get started, Lord, we want to thank you, Lord. We want to take this moment, God, to thank you and to glorify your name in the name of the Son of the living God, Jesus Christ. Father God, there's many places we could be this morning. There's many things we could be doing, God. But God, we chose this morning to come and be in your presence, God. Lord, we came as a church, and that word means the gathering, God. And this morning, God, we have gathered in your name. Lord, we have gathered in your name. We come into this place and gathered in your name to worship you, God. Greatly, greatly to be friends. I know we done it last week. Can we do it again? There's no place I'd rather be. There's no place I'd rather be. There's no place I'd rather be. Than here in your love, here in your love. There's no place I'd rather be. There's no place I'd rather be. There's no place I'd rather be. Than here in your love, here in your love. So set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. Cause I want more of you, God. I want more of you. There's no place I'd rather be. There's no place I'd rather be. Than here in your love, here in your love. Father God, we come as one people with one heart and one mind, God, to glorify the one and true God, the only Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, we ask that you would bless us with your presence, and we know that you have already, God. We know your word says, wherever two or more gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. And Lord, we have gathered in the name and by the power of Jesus Christ. So today, God, we thank you for your presence. Lord, we thank you for the promises that you have given us. Lord, we ask that you would help us, hold us, and keep us. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead. You. It's all right for you, but I'll get into it. The thing is, is uh, we start walking with the Lord and we start hearing him and obeying him. He will not let us stay in our comfort zone. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm dragging these two girls up here because God's pushing them out of their comfort zones. We've been meeting regularly, praying, and um, trying to hear the voice of the Lord and challenging each other to grow. And this last week, I've seen I've been seeing great growth in both, but this last week I've seen immense growth because we I felt led to do a little different and just say a you know a thank you and a short prayer and then just sit quiet and listen. And when we come out of that quiet time, I was just amazed at God. And uh, so I heard a scene. And all three were the same in a sense, but different. So I'm going to make them or ask them to share what they seen so they have to talk out loud in front of people. Are we okay with that? I do go first. Are we sit there? Are we sit there? And pray, and then we sit and see what God was going to show me, Roberta. And what I seen was a bright light, a 
I was just thinking of a metronome when you were selling me the hand going back and forth. Anybody know what a metronome is? Uh, yeah, I think I see it in my vision. Yeah. Metronome helps keep time. Time for the music. Okay. Metronome helps keep time. Okay. I'll say this. There's absolutely nothing. Nothing that's going to happen in this near future that Nobody's gonna be nobody's gonna be the same. I hope you don't want to be the same. If you want to be the same, I'm a, I'm worried about you, okay? Amen. First of all, I got birthdays. When's your birthday? Is so this the all for all month? No. Oh, okay. So I do it for the week. Oh it's the fifth okay. I thought it was the fifteenth. Five fifteen. Okay. Either way, we'll see you have a birthday to her too. Uh, I believe Sister Nan Booney Josephine's birthday is on the 15th, not the 5th. But we'll sing happy birthday to her anyway, okay? Uh, Pastor. Randy, the priest. Is this the 6th? Okay. His brother Rodney's is today, okay? That's the only reason I'm asking, okay? So Rodney, the priest, his birthday is today. They don't go to this church, but this is Pastor Randy at First Assembly's brother Rodney. His birthday is today, and Pastor Randy's is on the 6th. So we're going to sing happy birthday to them too, okay? And hopefully they watch so they can get saying happy birthday to. Now, Pastor Randy ain't going to watch till later, but hopefully he sees it, okay? Because uh, I never sang happy birthday to him before till right now. <laughs> happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Amen. All right. Tithes and offers. We are not passing the basket around right now. We'll start doing that in a month or so when everybody's no more cooties are going around or whatever. Uh, so we'll be passing. The, we won't be passing the plate today. If you want to give, 
The upper basket's right there. You can do it while I'm preaching. You can do it right now. You can do it later. You can do it as you're walking out the door. I don't care. But if you feel led to give, give. If you don't, don't give. Okay? I want God doesn't want a stingy giver. He wants a cheerful giver. Amen. So if you don't want to give, don't give. Uh, if there's people watching at home who didn't join us today, and I know there is because there's like 40 people missing. So uh, those of you at home, if you want to give, we still have an option to give online two different ways. I encourage you to use Tidely because it works a lot faster and a lot better. Uh, they can also, get that from our website. Uh, they can get it from our website. They type. To, yeah, they have to click on the Facebook page, go to the website, or just go to the website. And it's on, it's on the very first page, and it's at the bottom. You can't miss it. It says, offers, offerings, give, right? Uh, no service tonight. We are not having Sunday night service right now. We're going to start Sunday night service back up probably in a week or two, maybe three. We're just uh, trying to limit everybody's exposure and keep everybody safe at the same time, okay? Does that sound all right? Does that sound wise? Will's falling asleep and I didn't preach yet. I'm just giving you a hard time. Right now. I'm tired, man. Yesterday, let me tell you what my yesterday went like, okay? I got up yesterday morning, I was ready to go fishing. Me and Buddy was supposed to go fishing. Well, he didn't end up going fishing. So I went and uh, got my, my gun membership for the range renewed. And then uh, me and Carmen went and uh, went to Walmart and we got a pool. So I went home and the boys started mowing and we put this big old gigantic 14 foot pool up. And then I mowed the yard and then I baked three loaves of bread. I'm tired. I'll be by to get one. You'll be by to get one. <laughs> uh, anyway, I understand all about being tired. Me and Carmen hit the alarm, the snooze button three times this morning for like 15 more minutes. 15 more minutes. Well, so. Well, let me share my day yesterday was kind of busy like that, but my night when I was ready to go to bed, that little girl that you have some of her children decided it was time to have more children. <laughs> and so I set up one of the most for the night, four legged. Oh, <laughs> I'm thinking, what are you talking about? Yeah, you have one of her children, at least yeah, one, if not two. Um, but the uh, congregation, we had a beautiful, healthy cup of corn, but I wasn't there, so it was just fine. Oh, we got no puppies. Got no puppies. Well, we'll be praying for you. Uh, before we get started with the message, I want to go ahead and tell everybody that's here that's new. Just go ahead, reach across your neighbor, and grab their seatbelt, put it right on them, okay? Just snap their seatbelt on tight, because I'm just going to go crazy, okay? Now, the reason, the reason I decided to preach this message a few weeks ago on live stream was we have a whole generation of church folks that don't understand the sovereignty of God. They don't understand that God's in charge. They say it, but then they don't act like it, okay? We say, oh, God's in charge. God's in control. Well, if he is, then that should change how I think about God. It should change how I pray to God. It should change how my attitude is about what God's doing. All right? Think about this. I'm going to show you. The, I'm going to show you the weaknesses in our faith, okay? This is the weakness in our faith. I trust God. And then every time something goes bad, oh God, where'd you go? I trust God. But then they made a mistake on my paycheck at work and I didn't do as much as I thought I was going to do. I trust God. Where did God go? Oh God, please fix my paycheck problem. Oh God, please fix this health problem. We pray like we don't believe. Thank you. We talk like we don't believe. Amen. Belief is not something that I pick up and I lay down 
whenever it's convenient for me. I'm going to trust God. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Listen to me. Watch this. I'm going to show you some faith, okay? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was standing there in front of King Nebuchadnezzar. And King Nebuchadnezzar said, hey, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, if you don't bow down and worship this golden image, I'm going to throw you in this fiery furnace. You know what Christians today would have done? Oh God, please help me stay out of the fiery furnace. Come on, come on. I'm on my knees, God. Can't see how much I believe, God. God ain't swayed by your pity party. God ain't swayed by you getting on your knees and crying out like a blubbering baby. Amen. Because God has a plan. If God's sovereign, God has a plan. There's some time. There's some time coming up for each and every one of us. There's a time coming. There's a day. There's an appointment that none of us will miss. Amen. The Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die. That means I got an appointment set in time. God put it up there and it ain't going to change. There ain't a prayer anybody can pray. There ain't nothing a doctor can do. When it's my time to leave, I'm gone. Amen. And I won't be coming back. Amen? Amen. God is sovereign. So I'm going to say this the easiest way that I can. I'm going to show you some examples of God's sovereignty, okay? Somebody pointed a gun at you and said, deny Christ. What would you do? Everyone else would say, oh, I'm not going to deny it. But yet, every day we do in our actions. I, I don't believe anybody that says, I won't deny Christ. And then I can't get you to talk to somebody in the grocery store. Thank you. There it is. There it is. You tell me that you're pretty, pretty sure that you're going to be faithful to Christ in, in the face of certain death, but you can't be faithful to Christ in the face of certain criticism. Amen. There you go. But we're not talking about that right now. We're talking about the sovereignty of God. The sovereignty of God is this. Easton's Bible Dictionary declares the sovereignty of God his absolute right to do all things according to his own good pleasure. Amen. Now I want to show you something. That most of us don't understand. We don't get it. We think that, oh, I'm gonna say it, I'm gonna say it like it is. We think we have a part to play. Amen. We think we're in control in some way, in some fashion, okay? Amen. Do you understand that even when it looks like complete uh hmm, how am I gonna say this? Coincidence. When it looks like complete coincidence that things keep going wrong, even in that, God's being sovereign. Amen. And his sovereign Amen. will is acting upon those things yeah. every time. Yeah. Ephesians 1. I'll show you some Bible verses for this, and I got a bunch, so you better be ready, okay? Look at your neighbor and tell them to get ready. Get ready. Get ready. I will have you know that in almost every, no, not almost, in every one of these verses, every one of them, nowhere in it does God ask your opinion. Amen. Amen. All right. God doesn't ask your opinion, okay? I was talking about marriage on my monthly, I, I do a monthly uh, pastor's note, and I put it on Facebook, and I was talking about marriage. And in marriage, in the institute of marriage that was created by God, God did not ask man's opinion. God didn't ask man's approval. First of all, God didn't ask any one of us, how many of you did God come to you before you were born and say, hey Barbie, do you want to be born? No! It didn't happen. Now watch this. God didn't even ask Adam's opinion about a relationship. Did he? He, God saw that Adam needed a wife, needed a helpmate. He said, it is not good for a man to be alone. And what happened? Did he go to Adam and he go, hey, Adam, should I, should I make another creature? 
that is better suited for you. Should I make her this way and that way? God didn't do that. God made Adam fall asleep, took a rib out of Adam, gave it, uh, gave it to the dirt formed woman, and then woke Adam up and said, here, she's yours. Had no, Adam didn't have no choice. Think about that. You want prearranged marriage? There it is. Not even, not even thinking about prearranged marriage. God made her just for him. And in all that, the sovereignty of God, God is declaring when he said, when he gave Eve to Adam, what did he say? For this reason, a man will leave his father and his mother and cleave unto his wife. And the two shall become one flesh. So God didn't even just create Eve just for Adam. God created Eve for Adam and a purpose of getting married. Right. And I noted all on this in God's sovereignty is God sovereignly created Adam. God sovereignly created Eve. Sovereignly made them one flesh and sovereignly told them you're going to get married. And that's it. Then you consult with them. Do you know why? God doesn't need your opinion. Right. Nor your approval. God is not interested in you telling him that he can do something. Because God is in control. Most Christians have this finite idea that God is up there in heaven somewhere waiting on me. God is not waiting on you. God is not swayed by your opinion. God's not swayed by your lack of faith. God's not swayed by the measure of faith that you have. God is sovereign. God will be God and would be God even if you weren't here. Amen. He would still be God. Even if all of us vanished away like that, God would still be God. Amen. We got this idea in our mind that somehow my faith makes God greater. No, I'm sorry. God is perfect all by himself. God is all powerful all by himself. God is sovereign over all things. Nowhere, in anywhere in the Bible does the, the, the clay get to look at the potter and say, hey, I don't want to be a cup. It doesn't happen. Ephesians chapter 1. I know it took me a while to get there. Ephesians chapter 1. Somehow, We'll get through this. Tap your neighbor on the shoulder and tell them we'll make it. We'll make it. Watch this. Ephesians 1, chapter 1, verse 11. In whom we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who worketh all things and the counsel of, after the counsel of his own will. First of all, there's all kinds of stuff in there that we don't like, okay? What's one of the things that we don't like in there? Being predestined. We don't like that thing. We don't even like the word. We shudder at the word predestined nowadays. Why is predestined bad? Why is that bad? Why do people think it's bad? You want me to tell you why? Because people want to be in control. People have an illusion that they're in control. Young people, I know when I was young, I thought I'm going to do my own thing, my own way, and guess what? God got me right out of that. Amen. Well, Pastor, God doesn't always get everybody out of that. Nope. Sure doesn't, does he? There's a great mystery at work in the Bible. It's called the mystery of God's sovereignty and then the mystery that man has his own is accountable for his own choices and his own actions. Amen? Amen. But in all of it, God's still sovereign. Amen. Watch this. Go to Romans 8.28. You flip your Bible back about three chapters to Romans. 8.28. Watch this. Romans 8, 28 says this. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. 
to them who are called according to his purpose. For, he, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed into the image of his son so that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now here's another mystery that's working out in the Bible right now in all of this. What's the other mystery working in this? We have, we have predestination, yet man's culpable for his choices, right? We see both of these at, in this, even in this scripture, we see this, okay? Now what we, what we also do with the whole predestination thing is we start going, well, if God chose, then that means God's unloving and being unjust. Think about how much grace is being poured out on the world right now. Amen. Think about it. Noah, Noah and his family was the only ones that survived God's wrath the first time. Noah, Sodom and Gomorrah ain't got nothing on what happened to Noah. Okay? You want to talk about grace. By God's grace, he sovereignly chose Noah and Noah's family. And only Noah and only Noah's family <coughs> to survive the world being flooded and destroyed. Talk about unfair. Talk about God being unfair. What did it say before he destroyed the flood? Before he destroyed the world in the flood? Said God knew the hearts of men that they were wicked continuously and they did nothing good. I'm telling you, friend, nothing in humankind has changed. Amen. Nothing in humanity has changed. We are all desperately and hopelessly lost without Christ. We will follow whatever wicked device that we think of when we are outside of Christ. That's the truth. We're not looking for the light. We're not looking to be saved. We're not looking for God at all. That's what scripture says. And that's what I can bear witness in the world today. They're not looking for God. They don't care. They wouldn't, they, they would, they wouldn't care if God sent them to hell right now because that's how depraved and mentally and spiritually wicked people are. They don't care. So what changes that? The gospel and the sovereign rule of God. I wasn't looking for God when God found me. He just found me. We always tell our testimony about when we came to Christ. When in reality, Christ came to you. Amen. Jesus says this. Let's, let's, hold on, let's find that real quick. I like that verse and I want to find it. And I know I've got it written down here. <clears throat> Chapter 14. Let me show you something here. John chapter 14. That's why I can't find it because I'm not in the right verse. I'm not in the right chapter. <clears throat> oh, this is good stuff. Watch this. These things I have spoken unto you, uh, yet being present with you, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, will come, and the Father will send in my name. He will teach you all things and bring all things to your ruins whatsoever I have said unto you. Peace I leave with you, my peace, not as the world given. Give I unto you, let not your heart be troubled, neither be afraid. You have heard it said unto you, I go away and I will come again. If you love me, you will rejoice because I said I go unto the Father. For my Father is greater than I, and now I have told you before it has come to pass, when it comes to pass, you might believe. Hereafter, I will not talk to you much. We're going to skip up to verse 18, no, 15. Watch this. If you love me, keep my commandments. 
Somebody hold your hand up. Do you love Jesus? Do you love Jesus? If you love Jesus, he said, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father and he will give you another comforter that he might abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth in the world cannot receive. Notice it says the world cannot receive. Do you understand that you have to be in Christ to have the spirit of God at all? There is something going on in our new age way of trying to produce the gospel where we try to get the spirit ahead of salvation. It does not work. It cannot happen because to be carnally minded is to be against or an enemy of God. The carnal minded man cannot even discern the things of God. And it's a mystery to them. It's parables. Jesus told his disciples, I speak unto you plainly, but I speak unto them in parables that they would not see, that they would not hear, and hearing they would not see, and seeing they would not believe. Amen. Amen. You have to have Christ before you can ever have the Spirit. Amen. Yes. Before you can ever discern spiritual things. Amen. We've got worldly people leading, quote unquote, and I'm using quote quotes. We have worldly people leading so-called churches that have no, no understanding of what God really expects of people. Amen. Amen. I'm going to keep reading. <laughs> Watch this. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, but it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but after, but ye know him. For he dwells with you and shall be in you. Now watch this. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Yet in a little while the world seeth me no more. But ye see me because I live. Ye shall live also. At that day you will know that I am in the Father. And you are in me and I in you. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them. He it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father. And I will love him. And will manifest myself to him. Judah said unto him, and this is not a spirit, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said unto them, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my father will love him, and we will come unto him, and we will make our abode with him. And he that loveth me and keepeth not my sayings, the word the words which you hear are not mine, but the Father's which sent me. Now watch this. Everything he just said, he said, if you if you love me, if you keep my commandments, then the Father will come, and we will, he said, and I will manifest myself to you. There's no act of salvation without God manifesting himself Amen. to you. So even the act of salvation is absolutely the sovereign will of God at work in the lives of men and women. Are you going, well, preacher, uh, the Bible says that I got to believe and receive. That's true. The Bible's full of all kinds of mysteries. I have to believe and receive, but I still have to have a part where the Spirit of God comes and Christ comes and reveals himself to me, or what I have just thought I received, I don't have. Let's go back. I want to show you the sovereign will of God. Luke chapter 8. You want to see the sovereign will of God? We're going to show it to you. Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8 is full of a mystery. It's a parable. This parable is told by Jesus to his disciples, to the crowd that's all around him. He said, a sower went out to sow the word. Watch this. And it came to pass afterward, he went out through every city and village, preaching and observing and showing the good tidings of the kingdom of God. And they were, uh, the twelve were with him, and certain women which had healed, uh, have been healed of the evil spirit and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom seven devils was driven, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod, Stuart, and Susanna, and many others ministered unto him out of their substance. And when much people were gathered unto him together and were come to him out of every city, he spake a parable. A sower went out to sow his seed. 
And as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trodden, and fowls of the air devoured it. And some fell on a rock, and soon it sprang up, it withered away because it had no root. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. And others fell on good ground and sprang up and, he, and bare fruit a hundred and a hundredfold. And when he said these things, he cried, He that has an ear, let him hear. I'm telling you, friends, I need you to listen today. Those of you watching on Facebook and those of you in this room, he that has an ear, let him hear. Because we all think we got it. We all think we know how to get to God, okay? We all think that it's our way and my way and the way our church says it. But there's no other way except Christ. There's Amen. no other way except the way he told you to come. Jesus said, if a man would follow me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Amen. The real Amen. work of the Spirit of God in your life. You want to see the true salvation come up in somebody's life when they're willing to deny their self, when they're willing to lay down their life, when they're willing to follow Christ no matter what the cost, no matter what it looks like, no matter how crazy people think they are. When somebody's sold out, when they are absolutely, completely, it ain't about them, it's about Christ. You know somebody's saved. Amen. Amen. And all the people that just come and fill a church pew that claim to be Christians. I'm going to say it like this. I believe a church, the churches in America are full of lost people Amen. who yes. do not know Jesus Christ. And if, if, if nothing changes, we have a mass of people calling themselves Christians that will split hell wide open. Jesus told this parable and watch how his disciples react. His disciples asked him saying, what might this parable be? Now notice Jesus said to them this and I already said this earlier. He said unto you is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. This is right here is God's sovereign will at work and most of us would think God was being uh, showing favoritism and God was being unfair. But he was telling the disciples, I've chosen you. Amen. You know, we don't even choose God. God chooses us. He said, you have not chosen me. I've chosen you. Amen. No one, the Bible says, John chapter uh, 3, I believe, or John chapter 6. John says this, no one, Jesus, Jesus was saying, he said, no one can come to the Son except the Father draws him. God is sovereign. Watch this. He explains this parable. He said, now this parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Right? So if the seed is the word of God, what can we assume who the soul is? God. God sows his word. Not me. Not me. I do not sow the word. Preachers have preached that for years, though. Preachers have preached for years. I'm sowing the word. You ain't sowing anything. God sows the word. Amen. What you'll get when preachers sow the word is you'll get a fleshly Christian experience that is not salvation. That's what you'll get. And that's what we got in America. We got a bunch of fleshly, fleshly people who think they're saved because pastors thought they were sowing the word. God absolutely has to be the one sowing the word, Amen. or we're doing it wrong. Right. He said, now the seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are they that hear and come, uh, they that hear, then cometh the devil and take away the word out of their heart, lest they should believe and be saved. And on the, they that are on the rock are they that hear and receive the word with joy, and these have no root for which believe for a little while, and in times of temptation fall away. And they which fell among the thorns are they which have heard and go forth and are choked out by the cares and the riches and the pleasures of this life and bring forth no fruit to perfection. What did Jesus say? He said, every tree that does not bear good fruit is hewn down 
be cast into the fire. So I'm going to stop you right here in this parable. The first three people that heard, the first three people that the word was sown into in this parable, those three grounds, you got the wayside, the rocky ground, and the thorny ground, those do not represent salvation. Amen. They don't. That's right. Those people were not saved. Not at all. I'll show you my conclusion to that at the end of this chapter. The very last verse in this chapter explains everything that I just said. Are you still in Luke chapter 8? No, nope. uh, yeah, I'm still in Luke yeah. chapter 8. Okay. Verse 15. But they that on the good ground are they which with an honest and good heart, having heard the word and kept it, bring forth fruit with patience. No man, when he lights a candle, covers it with a vessel or puts it under a uh, uh, puts it under a bed, but setteth it on a candlestick that they which enter the house may see the light. For nothing is secret that shall not be made manifest; neither shall anything be hid that shall not be known and come abroad. Now, watch this. Jesus gives a warning right at the end of this, and I want you to get the warning. And I want you to understand why there's three soils that think they're saved. Those, that first person that heard the word, well, I know the gospel. That first person, I know the gospel, but the devil in my life keeps taking it away from me. Why? Because of my heart. There's not been a change. There's not been that moment where the spirit of Christ has come and manifested himself to me. That is death. When Jesus said in John 3, a man must be born again or he cannot even see the kingdom of God. Didn't say he can't enter. He said, he said, uh, except a man be born of water and spirit, he cannot see the kingdom of God. At first he said he can't enter, and then he said he can't see. So we understand that us going to heaven is absolutely dependent on the born again experience. Christ revealing himself to me. Christ making himself known to me. Jesus said, many will come to me in that day and say, Lord, Lord. And, uh, uh, and he said, though many will come to me in that day and say, Lord, Lord, did we not cast out devils in your name? Did we not do many wonderful miracles in your name? Did we uh, heal the sick? What did he say? He said, depart from me, you who work iniquity. First of all, healing, healing, casting out devils, Wonderful miracles, those are not evidence of salvation. None of them. We got preachers on TV right now. Oh, this lady got healed. It's not evidence of the Spirit. Notice that those things aren't even the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit show me that I have the Spirit of God in my life. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, uh, long suffering, gentleness, meekness, temperance against such. There is no law. Amen. Right? Amen. Ephesians chapter 6. You must be born again. Those that are on the wayside are those that the devil keeps coming and taking it away. There was no real faith. Those who are on the stony ground, they think they got it. But because they won't stay in one spot and get grounded, get rooted. They won't die. Jesus said, except a man deny himself, take up his cross. What's the cross represent? The death of Kevin. How do I know that? Because Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I that live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who Amen. loved me and gave himself for me. Every Christian, every person who really comes to faith has to die to their will, to their wants. To their desires. That's Christ's Amen. promise. Yes. Those that have no root won't stay grounded, won't submit. Jesus said this, except a seed of grain or corn fall to the ground and die, it will not produce anything. If you leave a seed of grain on the counter, you know what it'll do? It, it'll sit there and get hard and then it'll just start crumbling. But if you plant it and it dies, it'll bring forth a whole shoot that has hundreds and hundreds and hundreds 
of other corns that you can plant and grow more. Amen. And those that fell upon the thorns are they who, with the heart of wanting to be seen, chase after money or fame or position. And we've got whole churches that do that right now. They're all about send me your money and God will be a, give you a blessing. Do you think I couldn't do that? Do you think I couldn't get on Facebook and go, oh, if you want the blessings of God in your life, then you can send it on a 995 with his prayer call and God heal you. But I can just as big a liar as they are. Amen. That's not the gospel. The gospel didn't come to tell you you're going to have fame, fortune, and wealth and power. Jesus said, anyone who follows me, the world hated me, they're going to hate you. Right. And if you follow me, you're going to be, you're going to have all kinds. He said, in this world, you will have tribulation. He didn't say it's going to be easy. No fat naked babies on, on clouds playing harps. That's not what cherubim look like. Michelangelo painted those, but that ain't what cherubim look like. Matter of fact, if every if a cherubim showed up in this church right now, every one of us would wet our pants and fall on our face. That's right. Six wings, four heads, four faces, eyes everywhere. Shine like the noonday sun. None of us would be standing. None of us would be going, oh, you know, I, I'd love to have an angel. No, you wouldn't. Some might be right on the other way. Just telling you. Every time, why do you think every time angels show up in the Bible, they have to say, fear not? <laughs> or, get up, or get up off your face. Why do you think they have to say that? Because they are awesomely terrifying looking. That's right. That's right. Amen. Only those who are on the good ground with a, it says a good and sincere heart. What does that mean? A sincere heart sees God for who God is. A sincere heart sees me for who I am. We got this gospel message going around right now and I want you guys to hold your hand up if you've heard it. Well, God looked down through the annals of time and he just saw so much value in you. That he sent his son to the earth so that he could buy you back. God just knew there was something good in you. That's why God saved you. That is a lie. I'm sorry. I'm serious. It's all you can you can turn any TV channel on right now. You can go look on Facebook. It's all over it. The truth of salvation is this, that men and women are desperately wicked yes. and lost. Yes. Amen. Paul said, Romans chapter 1, Romans chapter 2, Romans chapter 3, there is no good in us. Every one of us are desperately wicked and flawed. Amen? And we all need Christ. God saved you not because he saw good in you. God saved you because God is good. And by God's sovereign will, God decided to do it. Not because God looked at Michael York and said, Michael York is just so great, I can't let him go to hell. That's not, that's not the gospel. That's not what God said. Why would we preach some fallacy like that? I want to I end with some scriptures right here, okay? Go with me if you will. And we've done this before. I just want to give everybody perspective, okay? Let's go to Revelation chapter, I believe it's chapter 1, where I want to start. Revelation chapter 1, yep, starting at verse 9. This is the God who we look at like. Now, can I say one more thing before I read this? Everybody knows that God, Jesus said, I don't call you no more strangers. I call you friends, right? Jesus wants to be your friend. 
We've heard that message, right? Y'all down the hall heard that message, right? Yeah, they heard that message. Jesus wants to be your friend. You heard that message, right? One of these days we're going to go to heaven and it ain't going to be no more friendly stuff. One of these days, we're not going to just get to look at God like our friend. We're going to have to see God in his awesome splendor all by ourselves. And you can either stand at the judgment seat of Christ and know you'll be saved, or you can stand at the great white throne judgment and know that you will not. Watch this. John chapter 1 verse 10 or verse 9 and I John who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and the presence of Jesus Christ was on the isle of called Patmos for the word of the Lord God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ and I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying I am Alpha and Omega the first and the last. What thou seest, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia and into Ephesus and into Smyrna and Pragmas and uh, Thyatira and uh, Sardis and unto Philadelphia and Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice <laughs> that spake to me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks and in the midst of the seven golden, uh, in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one likened unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to his foot, girded about the paps with a girdle on. And I heard, uh, and his head, and his head, and his hairs were white like wool, and his eyes were as white as snow, or and, and, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flaming fire, and his feet were as unto fine brass as if it were burned in a furnace and his voice sounded like the sound of many waters. I don't know if you guys have ever been to Niagara Falls or a big, big waterfall, but it's an awesome rumble that comes from these places. That you, the closer you get, the more inside you, you can feel it. It's just rolling and the sound waves are hitting you and boom, boom. Over and over. And John, this is what John is witnessing. And in his right hand he had seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that lived, liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. Write these things that thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. Watch this. This is just Jesus. Jesus not on the throne. But he was so awesome that John fell on his face as a dead person. In heaven, there ain't going to be no Pentecostals falling backwards. Come on, come on. In heaven, there ain't going to be no Pentecostals falling backwards and nothing changing and nothing moving in their life. There ain't going to be no false prophecies. There's going to be no false tongues. But when we see God face to face, everything we ever did is going to be laid bare. Woo. Flip over. <coughs> Excuse me. The Acts chapter 4. After this I looked up and behold the door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard as it were of a trumpet talk uh talking with me, which said, come up here, and I will show you things which must be hereafter. Now, first of all, I want you to understand, the first voice he heard, who was it? Huh? Verse 1. Chapter 4, verse 1. I thought, in Acts, 
No, I said Revelation. You said Acts. Yes. yes. No, I said turn over to chapter 4. Of Acts. You did. Acts. You said of Acts. Okay, Revelation. And we're all like, uh, Revelation. I didn't, if I said Acts, I didn't mean to. Okay, we're there now. The first voice that, you, first voice that John heard in Revelation chapter 1 was Christ. Now notice what he says in this verse. I want you to understand who's speaking, because we all get confused. After this, I looked and behold, and there was a door open to heaven. The first voice which I heard was, was it were of a trumpet talking with me, said unto me, Come up hither, and I will show you things that must be. Now John just got taken right up into the heavens. Now watch this. And immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, the throne was set in heaven. And one sat upon the throne. And he and he that sat upon it looked like jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow around about the throne in the sight, in sight like an emerald. And around about the throne were four living, uh, were, were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment and they had on their heads crowns of gold and out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices and there were seven lamps of burning fire before the throne which are the seven spirits of God and before the throne were also see, was also a sea of glass like an unto crystal in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion and the second was like a calf and the third was like the face of a man and the fourth was a beast flying like an eagle. And the four beasts had uh, each of them six wings about them and they were full of eyes within. And the rest, they rested not day or night saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God Almighty which was and is and is to come. And when those beasts gave glory and honor and thanks to him that sat upon the throne who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fell down before him that sat on the throne and worshipped, worshipped him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns on the thro uh, before the throne saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Notice that even in their song, they are speaking of the sovereignty of God. He said, for your pleasure. That's what they sung. For your pleasure they were, they are and were created. That's how we ought to see God. That's how we ought to reverence God. Not because we're good, but because God's good. Amen. Yes. Not because we have any authority or we have any say, but because God has all say and all authority. Yes. Not because our will, but because God's will. Yes. Every Christian has to ad adapt or adopt what Jesus said excuse me, in the Garden of Gethsemane. He said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, not what I want, but you will. See, if we really understood the sovereignty of God, we wouldn't pray like we pray right now. We wouldn't be so consumed with, oh God, meet all my needs, and oh God, give me a car, and oh God, make sure my house payments pay. My house, I don't care if I lose my house as long as I got Christ. I don't care if I lose my job as long as I got Jesus. I don't care if I lose everything I got. As long as I got, you know, as long as my name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I don't want to hear all this nonsense, people chasing stuff. You better be chasing after God. You better be running after him with everything you got. You better be understanding that if God has really given you a come to Jesus, Jesus comes to you and reveals 
the Father to you reveals himself to you, there had better be some change in your life. Amen. Amen. That's salvation. That's the message. The change is not, we don't change to get saved because salvation is absolutely free. God saves us sovereignly by his own free will and it is absolutely a free gift. The change in your life will be the fruit, will be the evidence. It will be the evidence that something happened and you are born again. That is the gospel. We're going to go ahead and stand all over this sanctuary. We're going to get ready to go. I know I preached a hard sermon this morning, okay? I understand. I understand it's not what everybody wants to hear. They want Joel Osteen. They don't want this stuff, okay? They want, they want T.D. Jakes, and they want all these other people that will tell them how great they are and how much God wants to bless them. They don't want to hear the truth. The truth is God loves you. Amen. Jeremiah said, God loves you with an everlasting love. And God, Jesus is, God's own son said, God loves you so much that he sent his only begotten son to this earth. So that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Now, just because God loves you doesn't mean you were good. That's right. You understand that? I, know, I, know. I love my kids even when they're bad, okay? Amen. Amen. Even when they're not doing right. I love my kids. But that sure doesn't that, mean they're good. I'm pretty sure that woman right there knows what we're marking. Oh, yeah. In life. <laughs> God loves you, and God wants you to hear the truth of the gospel and believe. Amen. And I'm praying today. I'm going to pray as we close. I'm praying that people in this room or people on the on Facebook, they hear this message and the real truth of the gospel that changes people's lives, that really makes people different, pricks their heart, their minds, and their consciences, that they would hear the word of the Lord and that God would reveal himself to them. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you and praise you for your work in our life, God. We thank you that you are sovereign over all things, God. We thank you that even in salvation, God, you are the one in charge. So, God, we ask you today, Lord, Lord, I pray that you use this message. I pray that those in this audience or those that are watching on Facebook or YouTube, God, that they would hear this message, God, that you would prick their hearts and their minds and their consciences, God. Take that stony heart out of God and reveal yourself to them. Let them hear the gospel for the first time or as it were the first time in their life, God. Let them believe. Let them receive. Let them repent and turn to Christ today. Lord, I pray that your will, your work, and your kingdom would become present in their life, God and in our lives all the more. Lord, we pray that you would help us as we leave this place, understanding that we may be leaving this building, God, but we never leave your presence. Lord, we ask that you would go with us and help us to be effective in what we do for you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.